Good morning. It's Monday, the first of April, and this is Govind Rajathi Raj broadcasting from Mumbai, India's financial capital. First, welcome to the new financial year. So, a very happy new year to you, and I do hope it's happy in every sense of the word, including balancing your books for the last year successfully. Our top stories and themes of the day. The last financial year was a blockbuster year for stock markets. Could the coming financial year, of course, repeat it? US Federal Reserve holds out once again on interest rate cuts. India's state budgets are bigger than the union budget, and yet few pay attention. State-owned energy companies step up the renewable thrust. The latest is a battery joint venture with Panasonic. There are so many lending apps, including fake, that the Reserve Bank of India is setting up a new agency to monitor them. This is a core report with Govind Raj Athiraj. Markets looking back and forward. Will the bounce continue? What can we take away from recent history? It depends on how recent. If you were tracking the stock markets in the last six to eight weeks, then it might be a little difficult to gauge where we are right now because markets have been falling. But cast your eye over the year 23-24 that ended on Sunday and things look encouraging. The question then, of course, is how are we poised for 24-25? That's the year that begins on 1st of April. That's today. So we will come to that shortly. Before that, let's go over the year that went by. So if you take away COVID-19's drops and rises, this was actually the best market performance in a decade in terms of returns. Then the Nifty 50 index was up about 29% for the last year. That's ended 31st March. The BSE Sensex was up 25% during the year, a little lower than the Nifty 50, but then 25% nevertheless. The overall market capitalization of all national stock exchange or NSE listed stocks jumped about $1.5 trillion or almost 50% in the last 12 months to a near record high of about $4.6 trillion. Also, if you had bought the index around the time the markets had hit their COVID-19 lows, then you would have gained something like 71%, which means several individual stocks, had you bought them, would have performed even better, actually way better. And I'm just talking about large caps or the larger caps. The story could have been actually rosier if you had bought into small caps and mid cap stocks. Small cap and mid cap stocks, by the way, despite everything that you've been hearing about them, have outperformed the benchmarks, adding 70 and 60% in that period, which is the last year. But then also remember that all indices have been hitting record highs consistently. And that, of course, has been the situation even on Wall Street with the S&P 500, Dow Jones and Nasdaq all hitting record highs even in recent weeks. On a comparative basis, the Nifty 50 has done better or almost better than most of its global peers, except for maybe the Nasdaq Composite and the Japan's Nikkei, which rose further. And I will come to Japan in a moment. Of course, not everyone could have timed this one, given that it was not just the markets or financial markets, but the world at large, which did not know where it was going. And I'm referring specifically to the COVID-19 lows. But by the way, not all Nifty stocks outperformed or even performed. And you would be surprised to know that they included companies like United Phosphorus or UPL, HDFC Bank and Hindustan Unilever. These were stocks that underperformed. Now a macro view. Overall GDP numbers for the last year have been strong and are likely to be around 7.6%, the fastest among large economies. So the economic underpinnings, without getting into too much detail, seem sound. So as we look ahead, what are the factors that are in favor and perhaps not in the markets? For one, the markets, although on the back of some hard talk by the Securities and Exchange Board of India on froth and exuberance, particularly in the mid and small cap space, have adjusted now which means that the entire market is not moving at the same pace and tenor. Instead, stocks and in some cases, sectors are branching away, some still up, but many down. The coming year would hopefully accentuate this trend, which is good news. The flip side, of course, is that investors plunge into lower price stocks because they find them affordable and not pay much attention to fundamentals, as has been happening in the past. Veteran market analyst Ambarish Baliga spoke to me about this phenomenon last week. And he specifically talked about sectors like railway stocks, where there was unjustifiable exuberance, at least in his mind, and therefore he cautioned investors. Now, to focus on large investors, fund flows are not only stronger this year as foreign institutional investors have started buying again after a longish break for reasons which are only partly clear. 
More specifically, foreign portfolio investors bought shares worth about $24 billion in the last fiscal after selling India for the last two financial years, that's before that. Domestic mutual funds have also bought roughly the same amount, although a little less. When I speak of foreign portfolio investors, I'm now referring to equities because they have been buying debt and a fair amount of it. And that number is likely to rise steadily as India's inclusion into global bond indices like the JP Morgan index is formalized in a few months. This year could and perhaps will see a China bounce back of sorts. Actually, that's already happened because China's markets are now up 20% from their bottom, having gained, according to one estimate in the South China Morning Post, about $1.75 trillion from their bottom. So could China continue to recover? It might. But China's problems are largely self-caused, so it is difficult to say how much the government really wants the economy to recover and if so, in which parts. For example, it does say that it wants a greater focus on high-tech like electric vehicles and renewables and those companies are doing better. On the other hand, it may be pushing down companies in the real estate space. Incidentally, China's manufacturing activity expanded in March for the first time since September, a sign that the world's second largest economy is stabilizing, according to Bloomberg. Both manufacturing and non-manufacturing activity levels are up in China right now. The bottom line from our perspective is that we are unlikely to see funds exiting China and flowing into India, at least at the pace we saw in recent months. That did happen for a while, of course, but that was earlier this year. Looking ahead, it does appear that India will continue to draw on more global allocations apart from emerging markets fund, while China may pull its own share. Remember, Japan, and we just talked about it a little earlier, is the other rising star, rather re-rising star, when it comes to equity flows. Last week, of course, the markets were strong. The Nifty 50 rose nearly 1%. I'm not getting into too many of those numbers because there's too much gap between Thursday last week and today for us to draw any clear conclusions on overnight or previous week impact. Though there could be other general trends that could play into the market as of today. Now, let's get back to the macro side. As things stand, investors large and small are assuming a return of the present government and thus policy continuity. Now, India's economy has been reasonably resilient as compared to many other economies and has faced its fair share of uncertainties, including the prospect of high oil prices, which did not happen because India managed to procure cheaper oil from Russia. Oil, incidentally, has been up this year, as we've been reporting. After falling close to 30% in the last financial year, oil prices are now close to 8% over and are currently at about $87 a barrel overnight. U.S. interest rates, when and how? Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell said again last week, the U.S. Central Bank isn't in any rush to cut interest rates as policymakers are waiting for more evidence that inflation has been contained. Bloomberg reported Powell speaking at an event on Friday saying that the fact that the U.S. economy is growing at a solid pace, the fact that the labor market is still very, very strong, gives us, that's the United States, the chance, or the Federal Reserve, the chance to be a little more confident about inflation coming down before we take the important step of cutting rates. Fresh inflation data released earlier is pretty much in line with our expectations, he said, but he reiterated that it won't be appropriate to lower rates until officials are sure inflation is on track towards 2% the rate they see as appropriate for a healthy economy. Investors are now betting the US Central Bank, the Federal Reserve, will make that first cut in June. Quite likely, it's a bet and a hope and a prayer, given how the interest rate saga has been going. Mutual funds grow in 2023. Will they continue to? Active large-cap mutual fund schemes have showed an improved performance in 2023, that's the calendar year, compared to their longer-term track record, according to a S&P Indices versus Active Funds report. In 2023, 48% of the active large-cap funds outperformed the BSE 100, reported the Business Standard. In the three- and five-year time frame, the share of outperforming schemes stood at about 12.5 and 14%, and the equity-linked savings scheme, or ELSS, were the best performers amongst all categories, as 70% of the schemes managed to outperform the BSE 200, according to the study, as reported by Business Standard. Now, mid- and small-cap schemes, which are generally the better performers among all categories, were actually laggards. Only 26% of the mid- and small-cap schemes managed to deliver better returns than the BSE 400 mid-small-cap index in 2023. Of course, mid- and small-caps have been thrashed in the last two months, thanks to several reasons, including, of course, regulatory warnings. 
All this is for course to help you decide if you want to to invest in a mutual fund as opposed to investing directly in a market. Forex reserves at another high. Time perhaps for some policy relooks. Several policy pronouncements of late like the imposition of presumptive tax on overseas expenditure by Indian citizens including by credit cards has led to speculation that there is a fear that India's foreign exchange reserves are draining away. Now that never seemed to be the case at least to me in recent years and that was equally not clear why we opted for some very logistically challenging and cumbersome methods of presumptive tax collection which would also to put it quite simply burdensome and onerous on the entire banking system and thus unfair on a regular or to use the term honest taxpayer so will 2024 25 that's the year that starts today be different well we actually don't know but one hopes that the regulators take comfort from india's record high forex reserves now at 642 billion as of the last week of march at this point reserves have been rising for the fifth straight week the rupee had closed at about 83 rupees 40 paisa against the dollar on thursday in general the rupee is holding at this range the previous friday it hit a record low but for more technical reasons as one of our guests on the core report pointed out including describing the action in the last hour of trade that day state budgets which total up more than the centers are surprisingly neglected An insightful study and column by Ashok K Bhattacharya editorial director at the Business Standard points to a few larger issues as well. First, as has been argued before as well, we pay very little attention to state budgets in India though together they are bigger than the union budget around which the song and dance levels have reached unprecedented peaks. Second, some of them are unexpectedly not doing well as measured by rising fiscal deficits or gaps between expenditure and income. Now this has some larger implications as well. Finally there is no common thread as such which links these states that have not been doing too well I spoke with Ashok K Bhattacharya and I also began by asking him why it was important for us to look at state budgets and what could be the impact of these budgets going awry What has struck me the most is that we as the economic commentators and even a uh, policy analysts and even economists we are far too obsessed with the centers finances but we don't realize that the states if you look at their budget size the states today in india account for almost 18% more than the budget size of center and yet much of the discussion that keeps happening in the national media particularly is about whether the center's fiscal deficit has gone up or that the center has done this right or that wrong this was the basis of my column that we need to shift our debate and discussion from the center's finances to the state finances which is why it is important to look at the state budgets and unfortunately what happens there is no central place where you can take a broad picture of the state budgets the reserve bank of india comes out with a report but that is 6 to 7 months later so if you want to do kind of a commentary and analysis and understand what is right what is wrong you need to do it like you do it for the center so that is the reason why i did it and what i found that i looked at 20 big states which came out with their budget for 23 24 and what comes out very clearly is that 13 out of them are now showing a fiscal deficit for 23 24 the current year that is ending today as is more than what it was 2 years ago which was the start of the post covid years now this is pretty serious at a time when even the center has reduced its fiscal deficit by 1 percentage point in this period the center's fiscal deficit have actually gone up for these 13 states and then it you know it is a fairly wide you know if you look at assam bihar chatisgarh uttarakhand jharkhand rajasthan may fit the bill in terms of expectations that the state may not have been run well but uttar pradesh which is otherwise an efficiently run state gujarat tamil nadu maharashtra goa himachal pradesh and even tripura they have shown a fiscal deficit which is higher than what it was 2 years ago so this is what is is a cause for concern because it is not a question of poorly run states which have done worse on the fiscal deficit front even the states which have done are efficiently run have done worse on the fiscal consolidation front 
And that's an area of concern. For these states, and let's say even if you were to look at the more industrialized states which you've pointed out, including Maharashtra and Gujarat, what does this mean for two constituencies? One is the citizen of that state and taxpaying citizen of that state. When I say taxpaying, in this case, I mean paying some form of indirect local taxes or even direct local taxes. And the other is business. For the citizens of the state, the lesson for me is that the state machinery and the ruling parties in those states are probably not used its own machinery for tax collection as efficiently as they have done. Now, it is not possible to conceive a situation where some states with the same similar rates, remember GST is broadly the same rate that is being enforced in all the states. Now, some states have done better collection. Some states have got their revenues in place. But some states have not got that much revenue. And therefore, if you don't get collect that much revenue, but you continue to spend that money either on the revenue account or on the capital account, you will naturally, your deficit will get wider. The message for the taxpayer in those states is that probably in the years to come, they will expect the states, the new government or the old government comes and they will levy more taxes or they will try to find out how they can collect and mobilize those revenues. But at the macro level, what is it, it shows is that a widening fiscal deficit weakens the state's capacity to spend more on uh, necessary infrastructure and capital projects. While it is true that some states have gone on an overcharge of sorts in capital expenditure, particularly states like Uttar Pradesh, Jharkhand and Goa, they really spend a lot on capital expenditure, but their capacity to increase such expenditure will certainly be limited because of the higher fiscal deficit. Is there any connection between this and the oft-repeated charge that states are being denied their due share of taxes from the government? At the macro level, uh, I would say the aggregate level, I see that particularly in 23-24, you will see that the transfer of resources from the center to the states have been fairly, fairly large in a sense that almost 3 to 3.5 percent of gross state domestic product, GSDP, accounting for the transfer to the states from the center. Now, this is about tax devolution. Now, it is possible to argue that when it comes to the centrally sponsored schemes or other projects, the central transfers, the states may have a reasonable cause for nursing these grievances. But at the macro level, aggregate level, I think but the devolution is taking place. In some states, it may not have money has may not been transferred, but that is a matter of detail and one can look into them a little closely. Yeah. Right. And some states, for example, again you can take a Maharashtra, Gujarat, which are already industrialized and investing heavily in further industrialization. Some of their industrialization also calls for pretty high subsidy support, like in the case of semiconductors. Now, there's a broader question here and then a specific question. So when states subsidize industry or anyone for that matter, where does that money come from? Does it come via the center again or is it the state's own kitty, so to speak? And secondly, if let's say other states who are generally not industrialized and also not, let's say, as prosperous, would they be at a disadvantage or should they be careful about such infrastructure projects which are also calling for subsidy support? Two very good questions. Yes, the state's capacity in providing these subsidies is more limited if your deficit is higher. It is likely that states that go in for these higher subsidies to attract investment are also showing how their deficits are worsening or widening. I am not saying that states like Gujarat or Tamil Nadu are attracting investments through subsidies, but it is also a matter of fact, these are the states which have also seen a deterioration in their fiscal balance in the last three years. So that certainly is a matter of concern. The states must be mindful of that. And that secondly, I would say that this does cause an imbalance in the overall country's economy because the states, when they are engaged in an unhealthy competition among themselves, to attract investments at the cost of fiscal consolidation, then I don't think you are encouraging healthy and equitable growth in the whole country. So essentially, you are saying that one bad boy will do something silly just to get 
bigger and larger at the cost of the whole country because the, ultimately the economy will suffer if the states, the fiscal deficit also goes up. Right, AKB. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Thank you. And now an agency to monitor rogue lending apps. It is somewhat disturbing to note that there are so many lending apps or applications on mobiles typically that the Reserve Bank of India wants to set up a digital trust agency. But the numbers before we get to that are quite revealing. The Reserve Bank of India had shared a list of 442 unique digital lending apps with the IT ministry to whitelist with Google. That means these are all fine. Google has removed some 2,200 digital lending apps from its app store between September 22 and August 23, according to a report in the Business Standard. On the other hand, if you were to add last year and the year before that, Google has now removed something like 4,700 illegal loan apps from its Play Store. This was revealed in February this year in a statement made in the Upper House of Parliament. Google had also said it had updated its policy regarding enforcement of loan apps so as to ensure that the apps that are there are either connected with or are working with regulated entities of the Reserve Bank of India. Business Standard also reported that as part of its efforts to curb growing cyber fraud, the Reserve Bank is now considering setting up a Digital India Trust Agency to stop the mushrooming of illegal lending apps. The proposed agency will enable verification of digital lending apps and maintain a public register of those verified apps. Apps not carrying the verified signature of this agency could be considered unauthorized for the purpose of law enforcement, according to sources speaking to Business Standard. A verified mark, being what it is presumably, would be more consumer or saver friendly, particularly at a time of rising fraudulent activities and unscrupulous practices on loan apps. India's state-owned energy majors step up on renewables. India's oil majors are in a major rush to diversify and add renewable capabilities into their portfolio, presumably also because of some subtle pushes by the government. Earlier, we spoke of how almost all energy companies owned by the government are pursuing various renewable energy mandates. Bharat Petroleum or BPCL, for example, is setting up 7,000 electric vehicle charging stations, which are rolling out as we speak. Bharat Petroleum has a network of 21,000 fuel stations. Oil India and HPCL are setting up green hydrogen plants, solar plants, compressed biogas, among other initiatives. All of these initiatives, by the way, run into tens of thousands of crores and most of that is being spent or will be spent in the next couple of years. The latest is Indian Oil Corporation has said it has signed a pact with Panasonic Energy to form a joint venture to manufacture lithium ion cells in India. The agreement follows an initial understanding between the two companies on lithium ion cells in January and this was released by way of a statement made on Sunday. Lithium-ion batteries, which power electric vehicles and are used to store energy, are expected to play a major role in the overall thrust towards renewable energy and, of course, reduction of greenhouse gases. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopsis or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening.